Muy buenas tardes. El que les habla es el contralmirante Luis del Carpio Azálgara, director de la Escuela Superior de Guerra Naval del Perú. El día de hoy, eh, continuando con los esfuerzos para difundir conocimiento a los oficiales y también al público en general, nos encontramos acá en la Escuela Naval agradeciendo al contralmirante Curvo Otger Garfias por recibirnos en nuestra alma mater y tener la oportunidad el día de hoy de recibir, es un placer recibir al doctor Andrew Wilson, doctor profesor del Departamento de Estrategia y Política del U.S. Naval War College. El doctor es el director del Centro de Estudios de Asia Pacífico dentro de la Escuela de Guerra de los Estados Unidos. El doctor ha dado conferencias y es profesor de diferentes centros de estudios, no solo dentro de los Estados Unidos, sino alrededor del mundo. Ha sido autor de numerosos libros y artículos sobre historia militar de China, el poder naval de China, Sun Tzu, el arte de la guerra, ¿no? y también este, estrategia, teoría, teoría desde, desde la antigüedad hasta la era de la información. El profesor también ha presentado eh, varias exposiciones sobre el arte de la guerra, grandes estrategas y pensadores, y entendiendo la China imperial, dinastías, vida y cultura. El profesor Wilson cuenta con un doctorado en historia y en lenguajes de Asia en la, de la Universidad de Harvard, y el grado de el grado en estudios eh, de Asia Pacífico de la Universidad de California, en Santa Bárbara. Ah, bueno, está enseñando en el United States Naval War College, ha enseñado en la Salve Regina University, en la Universidad de Harvard, en el Departamento de Historia, en el Departamento de Lenguajes de Asia y Civilizaciones de la Universidad de Harvard, y en el Departamento de Historia del Wellesley College. Tenemos el placer de contar con tan distinguido profesor. El día de hoy nos va a presentar eh, una exposición sobre la hegemonía y humillación de China. Con ustedes, el doctor Andrew Wilson. Muchas gracias, damas y caballeros. Es un placer estar aquí. Siempre es un placer ver a exalumnos. Es un placer haber tenido en mi seminario al almirante del Carpio hace más de siete años. Sí, les puedo probar hoy a ustedes que no ha cambiado mucho eh, cuando eh, esas uh, fotos fueron tomadas. Incluso creo que utilizaba la misma camisa que uso hoy. Eso fue un intento de broma. <risa> bueno, ¿podemos seguir? Voy a utilizar un puntero o algo. Las diapositivas, por favor. Algunos de ustedes ya han visto esta okay, conferencia. We'll Lo vamos a hacer de manera diferente. Bien, excelente. Así que el tema de hoy es muy rápido, lo que considero unas uh, cosas de las que todos 
in particular the attitudes uh, and behaviors of the Chinese government uh, and the ways of thinking of the Chinese population, especially when it comes to uh, international relations, uh, to, to the way the Chinese people and the Chinese state, the Chinese Communist Party, view the outside world and how they operate on the world stage. No. Oh. Next slide, please. Okay. So the uh, the underlying uh, thesis of this presentation is that there are two narratives, what we in social sciences call meta narratives, that dominate the way the Chinese people think about the past and condition their behavior in the present and the ways they think about the future. Now these two potent historical meta-narratives, I say profoundly inform Chinese attitudes and behaviors. Um, and these have huge implications for domestic politics. History matters in every country, uh, but it matters particularly in China. Next slide, please. There we go. So, um, so what are these things? I said that we have these two competing meta narratives. One is humiliation, and the other is hegemony. And humiliation is the experience of China in the last about 200 years. Okay. And I think one can sum up the Chinese Communist Party's project in the last 70 years, and especially what Xi Jinping is trying to do, is to make China great again. To re return to a, a, a time in the past when China was a regional hegemon. To essentially erase the national humiliation that China suffered in the 1800s and the 1900s. To get back to what China was before the West arrived in force in East Asia. So these are absolutely core to Xi Jinping's agenda. What you see on this banner uh, are two paired slogans. Um, it's important to note that these are school children uh, waving the flags, wearing their school uniforms. They're also writing on this banner, okay? So you can see this is a mobilization of the youth at a very, very young age for these kids, four or five, perhaps. Uh, and what the banner says is, never forget national humiliation and revitalize the Chinese nation, or the great Chinese nation. Now, you cannot do one without the other. If one fails to remember yeah. the <laughs> social humiliation, China cannot become great again. So I'll start first with the national humiliation. So the Never Forget National Humiliation is largely built around a series of military and political failures in the 19th century, accelerating in the early 20th century. Uh, it begins with the Opium Wars, uh, which the first Opium War is 1839 to 1842. There are a couple of other, it didn't last to 1942, but there was a couple of other wars. Um, so a series of military defeats followed by treaties which saw a progressive erosion of Chinese sovereignty and territorial integrity. So increasingly foreigners, initially Westerners but later Japanese, uh, began to play an ever larger role in China's domestic economy, increasingly in its politics. Uh, moreover, large pieces of territory, initially China's client states, right, like Tibet or Korea, started to spin off out of the orbit of uh, China's gravitational pull, uh, and then pieces of Chinese territory itself were carved off, became spheres of influence of other powers, or were outright annexed by other powers, such as Taiwan, which was annexed by the Japanese in 1895 
as a result of one of these military failures. So it's defined by weakness uh, and defeat, followed by these treaties, which are collectively called the unequal treaties. Um, they're called unequal because China, as the defeated power, had much less bargaining leverage. And the conditions of these treaties saw China as you know, taking it on the chin uh, from these outside powers, increasing a progressively uh, denying China control over its internal e economy uh, and over its own territory. One of the most galling uh, manifestations of the unequal treaties was the treaty port system. Uh, by the beginning of the, the 20th century, there are nearly 100 cities in China. Uh, the first five were established in 1842, but by the beginning of the 20th century, there was nearly 100 of these treaty ports. And in these treaty ports, foreigners were exempt from Chinese law. They lived in foreign enclaves. They, were, they had their own police forces. They had their own judicial systems. This is a concept called extraterritoriality. And increasingly, these foreigners began to play an ever larger role in China's internal economy. They also included many, many missionaries that spread you know, foreign, foreign belief systems in China. Uh, they also started to transform the urban landscape in China. This is the, the waterfront in Shanghai. Uh, you see there foreign style banks. You see the beautiful, towards the end there with the pyramid roof, that's the classic Art Deco Peace Hotel, uh, the nicest hotel I've ever stayed in. Uh, but here you see that treaty ports actually inscribe foreign domination onto China's landscape. The Bund looks pretty much exactly the same today. So as a Chinese tourist visiting the Bund, it's beautiful, it's fascinating, but it also screams foreign domination. Okay? While all this foreign catastrophe is happening, all these diseases of the skin, as Chiang Kai-shek called them, uh, were happening, China was racked by massive internal crises. Not just uh, demographic and uh, ecological disasters, um, epi ep epidemics, famine, plague, what have you. Uh, there was also several truly massive civil wars in China. Uh, here's a kind of a map of this series of disasters of the 19th century. Uh, the largest of these uh, right here is the Taiping Rebellion, which lasts uh, from 1850 to 1964, just one of them, uh, was the bloodiest civil war in history. As many people died in the Taiping Rebellion as died in World War I. Okay? Gives you an, a sense of the national trauma that China has suffered in the modern age. So when you talk about humiliation, this is not humiliation in a soccer match, right? This is the crushing, as it were, of the spirit of the Chinese people and the erosion of its sovereignty, okay? As if that wasn't bad enough. Great foreign powers start to carve off pieces of Chinese territory. I mentioned this earlier, right? The once mighty Qing Empire, and I'm going to talk about the Qing Empire in a moment, uh, had once had its own spheres of influence, but now parts of the Qing were becoming foreign spheres of influence. Uh, Tibet, British sphere of influence. Manchuria, first Russian, and then Japanese sphere of influence. The entire Yangtze Valley was a British sphere of influence, but the United States Navy also patrolled the Yangtze River. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having a foreign navy patrol the greatest river in your country? So it's being carved up. Um, so these foreign powers have these huge spheres of influence. Not only have China's former client states spun off, like Indochina, Korea, um, but pieces of territory are being carved off. If that wasn't bad enough, after the fall of the last dynasty, 1911-1912, uh, there was a brief experiment with constitutional democracy 
that collapsed in a couple of years. At that point, warlords took control. So China was then carved up internally by a bunch of different warlords. Many, they had their private armies. Um, in many areas of China, it was a narco state. Private armies funded by the opium trade. Armies existing not for political purpose, but simply to prey on the people. When I describe this to my students, especially those coming back from the wars that the United States has fought for the last 20, 20 years, I just tell them, imagine Afghanistan times 40. And that's the situation you see in China at this point. Then the Japanese invade. First in 1931, essentially annexing an area as large as France and Germany combined. It's the area called Manchuria. And then invading China proper. In the eight-year war that followed, as many people died in China as did in the Soviet Union during the Second World War national trauma. But in 1949, the Chinese communists come to power. They said the Chinese people have stood up. And the project from then there forward has been to make China great again. But you might ask yourself, if you look at the math, if you look at the newspapers and the Financial Times today, when you say, isn't China great already? Shouldn't China be a sated power? It's got it's the world's uh, factory, still is. Uh, it's got huge uh, ambitions in all these emerging technologies. It's got the, at least the number two economy in the world. Some might say the number one economy. Uh, huge growing global influence. Already had global influence from his position on, uh, on the UN Security Council, but increasing global influence. The Belt and Road Initiative, all this investment. Uh, this effort to spread Chinese soft power through Confucius Institutes and various influence operations. Um, it's a lender now. China used to be a debtor. Now it's a huge lender. Uh, it's got the world's largest military. It's got the world's largest navy by far, by, in terms of tonnage. Uh, and it's second only to the United States in military spending. So doesn't that make China great? Well, that depends on how you define great. Um, does Xi Jinping think China is great now? Is it great enough? His answer would be no. The answer would be no. Uh, you see this quite often in these big displays of national pride in China. This is the celebration of the uh, 70th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it was October 1st, 1911. Big, classic, Soviet-style parade uh, weapons. Uh, the, these are actually uh, uh, UN peacekeepers. China has a large UN peacekeeping role. The army, the navy, the ballistic missile force, all, all on display. But there were 20,000 carefully vetted attendees at this parade. There were about 40,000 people marching. 20,000 people had tickets to watch the parade. The rest of the population of Beijing was told to stay inside. Is that, is that a secure and sated great power? So, what is the definition of great? And here we're going to go back to that last dynasty I talked about, the Qing, Q-I-N-G, Qing. Well, it's a massive, massive state. It is significantly larger than China is today. You see, for example, the Republic of Mongolia was part of it. Large stretches of, the eastern, uh, of, of eastern Russia even bigger parts of Central Asia, truly massive. But it wasn't a Chinese empire exclusively. Uh, this core part here, you know, to the, the south and the east, yes, that's China. That's what we call China proper. But there were these huge areas that had populations of Manchus, of Mongols, of Tibetans, of Uyghurs, uh, all sorts of different people. Uh, and the dynasty itself was not Chinese. The dynasty was Manchu. And they managed to work out this really efficient system of balancing all these competing ethnicities uh, and competing strategic priorities. How many different you know, axes of strategic energy might a state this large have, right? It's, uh, it's a tough, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a tough act to follow. 
in terms of national greatness. So not only is it physically huge, uh, it's a highly successful state. It was probably, it was the richest and probably the most militarily powerful state uh, until the end of the 18th century and possibly even into uh, the early 19th century. The economy, even at the end of the 19th century, vastly uh, eclipsed that of, say, even Great Britain, the world's great trading power. So this is a monster state. How is it all really done? Well, this is the most famous person you've never heard of. Uh, this is the, the Emperor Qianlong. Uh, he ruled uh, China essentially from 1735 to 1799. So he dominates the 18th century. Uh, he adds 30% to the size of the empire. Uh, has anyone been to Beijing here? Okay, every other historic site in Beijing says built by the Qianlong Emperor. Uh, so he physically transformed the empire strategically, uh, physically transformed the capital city, uh, massively significant individual. This is the man who made the Qing Empire truly, truly great. So, this is a huge, this is a tough act to follow. Uh, you will notice, however, uh, he's a Manchu, he's on horseback, uh, and also his, this is the most favorite, favorite, famous portrait of him, and his favorite, uh, which was painted by a Jesuit uh, who was serving in his court as a court painter. So this was not a man who thought about the Great Wall and nothing beyond it. Uh, this was an incredibly cosmopolitan individual. When his armies conquered Central Asia, annexed what is now Xinjiang province, he's sent off to Paris for a set of bronze plates so that he could print these immense color books, uh, illustrated journals of his conquests of, of what is now Xinjiang province. Very cultured, very cosmopolitan individual. So a lot of people in China and outside of China uh, look back to these glory days when China was a regional hegemon to make the argument that there existed something that's called the Chinese world order. Uh, some of you might have heard the term all under heaven. That only is there a theory that China should be a dominant pole in the international system, but that historically it was a dominant pole, the dominant pole in the international system. And that China's goal is to get back to that state get back to when China not was not only a regional hegemon, but a global hegemon. That in fact, the modern era of Western domination is an aberration from the norm of world history. And this is how Xi Jinping looks at things. And if you don't believe me, ask Xi Jinping himself. Uh, he is actually, he's probably the busiest person alive. Uh, he's got the most responsibilities of anybody on the planet. That's his own fault. Uh, but he, in addition to all his other duties, is personally overseeing a history project about this dynasty, that he's collecting all the historical primary materials and secondary materials and creating this huge database, but he's also editing those materials to show this dynasty and this ruler to be a natural hegemon, to be a benevolent natural. hegemon to make the argument that there was a Chinese world order. And a lot of people believe this particular narrative. No less than But was Pero the Qing a benevolent or natural hegemon? Well, the answer is yes. In some cases, it's a tremendous no? amount of soft bueno, power. Sí, en algunos it casos, una uh, gran cantidad de polos económicos. Tremendous gravitational pull on the el global economy. Gran, if you think about it, think about you know, all the silver from Peru that flooded into China. China. Right? Lo que Perú importa de China. Tons and tons toneladas y toneladas. Porque los europeos, europeos quieren muchas cosas y los chinos no van a buscar los mercados, sino ellos son el mercado. Lo que mueve el polo de la economía mundial. Cuando dicen no, claro, China tiene un poder blando. 
el cual es increíble y es una forma de lenguaje muy particular. Las instituciones y el Estado de China, todos son geniales. Este es un ejemplo de los poderes blandos, pero otras cosas se han construido por las espadas. Y el centro de su interés es Taiwán. Todos fueron conquistados. She wrote an op-ed about Xi Jinping's history project. So instead of a regular empire, an empire of conquest operating like lots of other empires have throughout world history, including the United States, uh, Xi Jinping is trying to rewrite the Qing as this sort of cultural and economic behemoth, a state so charming economically and culturally that it overawed its, its neighbors, drew them enthusiastically and affectionately into the Chinese orbit. As a result of this op-ed, she was declared persona non grata in China. And Xi Jinping named and shamed her. So that's how important this narrative is for one of the world's most powerful men to go after a professor at a New England liberal arts college. So when you see Chinese behavior in, say, the South China Sea, you see these, this combination of hegemony and humiliation combined. The claims that China makes to the South China Sea right, uh, depend on that hegemony narrative, that China was great long before the Philippines existed or Vietnam existed, long before the United States Navy ever sailed the seas. The Chinese fleets, the treasure fleets, were radiating out through the South China Sea. So China's existence, and especially its regional dominance, justifies these completely unrealistic and ahistorical claims to the South China Sea. Okay, so there's those historical claims, but the South China Sea is also viewed through the prism of the century of humiliation, right? So this is from the chief, the former chief of the, the People's Liberation Army Navy, Wu Shengli, and he says in China's history, Right? We've been invaded many times. The most recent and most destructive of those invasions have come from the sea. Not only were we militarily incapable, our Navy was not up to the task of national defense, we as a nation simply did not understand the importance of the maritime realm. We didn't understand maritime law. We didn't understand complex uh, uh, navigation. We did not keep pace with our great historical legacies. And this is why China was laid low in the 19th and 20th centuries. So you see those two things combining in the South China Sea. You see them combining in Xinjiang. Remember I said Xinjiang became part of the Qing Empire, the greatest land empire of its age during the 18th century, during that apex of China's hegemony, during the reign of Qianlong. Okay. But in the course of the century of humiliation was ripped away, right? It was, it, was, it was part of the great game between Britain and Russia in Central Asia, ultimately uh, uh, become, falling into the Russian sphere of influence uh, and only nominally returning to Chinese sovereignty uh, in the 1940s. Uh, but, so it's got that, the justification for Xinjiang as a product of hegemony, and the insecurity that the Chinese state feels in Xinjiang is a product of that century of humiliation. Moreover, Xinjiang is absolutely pivotal to Xi Jinping's efforts to make China great again. The biggest part of that project is what we call the Belt and Road. 
uh, and it's, this is this um, this is this continental economic silk belt through Central Asia, as well as the maritime Silk Road through the South China Sea into the Indian Ocean, also increasingly stretching across the Pacific uh, to South America. So when you look at Xinjiang province, sorry, uh, three axes of the uh, Belt and Road to, through uh, of the, uh, sorry, the, the Silk Belt, this continental aspect of it, three of the main trajectories, these go north into Russia, uh, through the middle, into, uh, through Central Asia, into the Middle East, and eventually to Europe, and then south, through Pakistan, into South Asia. Okay, all three of those key trajectories pass through Xinjiang province. So security is absolutely essential. And rather than seducing the people of Xinjiang with all those great cultural uh, attractions uh, that you know, the Qing state might have had, although they were limited in this very ethnically different part of China, instead of doing that, you see these insecurities at play, right? The people of Xinjiang are victims of these competing narratives of hegemony and humiliation. And the way the Chinese are approaching this, and Xi Jinping in particular is approaching this, is not by winning over or even assimilating the population. It is about uh, harnessed, basically uh, indoctrinating the youth, sterilizing the young, waiting for the population of Uyghurs to simply drop into maybe one or two million. They'll man the theme parks, uh, they'll sell trinkets in the markets, but the region will be overwhelmed by ethnic Chinese uh, and developed as the center pivot of the Belt and Road. So this explains the military uh, occupation, the mass incarceration, uh, what, what some have called a cultural genocide. So we also see that these two areas of, of focus, these core national interests, South China Sea, Xinjiang, for example, um, also serve party interests and national interests. Because if you think about the century of humiliation primarily being a uh, a product of military weakness and political division at home in China, uh, exploited by foreign powers, how better to show the indispensability of the party and of the party's control over the military and the modernization of that military under party control. That's good for the party because the party has three top priorities. Keep the party in power, keep the party in power, and keep the party in power. This also justifies Xi Jinping's massive military reforms, his efforts to re-engineer the PLA, not, to, not just to create a modern, capable military that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best militaries in the world, but also to increase the control that the general secretary of the Communist Party, the head of the Chinese state, has over the military. And general, that's good, right? To have the head of state have control of the military, the military being subordinate to political leadership. So, but it's not just about making it subordinate to secretaries general in general, it's making it subordinate to this particular secretary general. And this is why these hegemony and humiliation narratives are so crucial to Xi Jinping and such a central piece of his uh, plans to make China great again, uh, and also to keep himself in power and alive. You see some of these manifestations in the much talked about uh, social credit system. Not nearly as bizarre or, or uh, Orwellian as some make it out to be. Uh, you could see also in the China's response to the COVID, this sense of insecurity, but also uh, the prickliness, right? Uh, not just uh, insecurity, but sensitivity. The, 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 the ways in which foreign countries, un, my own country, uh, unfortunately talked about the, uh, the origins of, of COVID-19, regardless of what you think about it. Um, but also this tendency of China to lock down 
rather than to open up in the midst of a national crisis. This all goes back to these insecurities laid there. But also the desire to show itself to be a leader, right? China wants its model of response to COVID to be a model. It's not a, it's not a good model, but you know, it wants to sell that. It also wants to you know, show China's greatness in terms of the uh, medical response, the pharmaceutical response, right? To show China to be a leading pharmaceutical power. Right? So rather than to participate or, or cooperate with other nations, uh, cooperation is dangerous because it invites, uh, invites uh, you know, uh, enemies into the camp, as it were. So ultimately, it's all about keeping the party in power. And while these narratives, however, are, are absolutely cynically deployed by the party, the humiliation narrative definitely has hold on the Chinese national psyche, on the collective psyche. It's, not, it's no longer propaganda. It is fully embraced and believed by the vast majority of the Chinese people. So when you interact with our Chinese friends, just keep that in mind, okay? Understand how, China's, how the Chinese outlook about history and about the world outside of China is heavily conditioned by the century of humiliation. The hegemony narrative is just getting started in China, fully embraced by Xi Jinping, but just getting started. But it's gaining a growing audience. So if you look at China becoming greater, we're perhaps even losing a couple of steps. Keep that narrative in mind. Keep in mind how this increasingly unrealistic view of China's past greatness influences Chinese attitudes. And when you pair those things with this incredibly ambitious agenda of Xi Jinping to make China great again, right? To set all these sorts of standards, uh, unrealistic expectations based on flawed narratives of a hegemonic past, on overwrought concepts of humiliation. That's a dangerous combination because grievance, entitlement, Unrealistic expectations are a truly dangerous combination. Not only is that going on, China is insecure for many, many, many reasons. Not just because of this century of humiliation narrative. It's insecure for all these other reasons. Food insecurity, demographic crises, water insecurity, right? And in a country on the scale of China, you can only imagine how this haunts China's leadership and China's population. So those are two things I think everyone should know about China. Thank you very much. Bueno, estamos atentos a alguna pregunta del auditorio. Señor, ¿puedo hacer la pregunta en inglés o en español? Good evening, sir. Um, I'm Lieutenant Sardan. Uh, thank you for giving us such an interesting presentation about China and its history. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I had the chance to be a PEP officer at the Undersea Rescue Command in San Diego. And I've seen the uh, big concern about um, U.S. Navy, well, DOD concern, United States 
concern about um, China's uh, exponential military growth. And my question goes related to the current uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, do you think that China will uh, try to do the same with Taiwan and how it, will, it would have affect around the world? Thank you, sir. Uh, excellent, excellent question. Um, there is a tremendous amount of focus uh, in the U.S., in particular in the U.S. military, State Department, economic circles uh, on China. Um, increasingly thinking about China not merely as a competitor, uh, but as a potential combatant. Um, so going from maybe frenemies to full, full up enemies. Uh, I think a lot of that is overplayed. I'm not a fan uh, of the regime in Beijing. I think they have, uh, they have uh, uh, evil inclinations um, and they certainly would, would love to get Taiwan back uh, and are, are definitely developing the military capabilities to um, problematize uh, any U.S. intervention in a Taiwan Straits crisis. Back in 1996, uh, the last Taiwan Straits crisis, the Beijing was trying to influence democratic elections on Taiwan, did military exercises in the Straits. Uh, the United States deployed two carrier strike groups to the waters off Taiwan. Uh, Beijing found out about it on CNN. So the United States freely and rapidly intervened in an issue that the Chinese feel very strongly about, tied into both hegemony and humiliation, at will. We interfered at will. So ever since then, one of the big drivers of China's military modernization, especially of its Navy and its missile forces, uh, have been to make such a repeat performance by the United States Navy more and more painful. So that were a crisis to rise, you know, and China was forced to act or chose to act, uh, that U.S. intervention would be much more bloody and much more costly. So that's what's going on for a lot of the motivations driving that. But now China has the capability and the increasing confidence. Um, however, whereas a generation ago, there was a large constituency in Taiwan that felt that they were still Chinese, who felt strong bonds to the mainland, who wanted to maintain the status quo. Uh, now, something like 80% of the population on Taiwan thinks of themselves as Taiwanese. They might have family bonds and cultural bonds to the mainland. They are not, but they are not mainland. They are their, their own people. And much of that has been a, re a result of Chinese behavior. Uh, very ham-handed efforts at information warfare in Taiwan, influence operations. Uh, all this saber rattling that's going on. Uh, the, the flights into uh, Taiwanese airspace, although that's a pretty complicated fa issue, but it certainly gets a lot of play. So, so while the military capabilities of China are increasing, the chances of a peaceful resolution or peaceful reunification are declining. Uh, and that's a dangerous combination. Now, what about the lessons of Ukraine? Well, uh, Operations on land are difficult enough. Operations at sea, in particular amphibious operations, are an order of magnitude more complicated. Um, moreover, when it comes to ships, as we saw with the Moskva uh, off the Crimea, when bad things happen at sea, they go bad really fast uh, and with devastating results. So I think the failures of the Russian military have been cautionary. Uh, to China when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, in addition, the various assumptions that the Chinese shared with Vladimir Putin, and I, I direct you to this joint statement that Putin and Xi Jinping put out at the Olympics. Um, it, seems, it seems like a thousand years ago, the Olympics, doesn't it? Um, but the joint statement that they put out uh, about how things like NATO expansion were efforts of 
the West, and particularly the United States, to cling to its own hegemonic designs, um, to cling to the anachronisms of you know, the, the unipolar moment, as it were. Uh, and that also the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan was a signal of America's retreat from engagement. Uh, and the weaknesses or the political infighting in Europe, or especially in NATO, all symbolic of a breakdown of cohesion uh, of the democratic nations. Um, nothing could have been further from the truth. So I think that is also a, a shock to the system in Beijing. But Xi Jinping is an individual he might look like he has long-range plans, uh, but he is also a person in a great hurry. Um, he can be president, or more importantly, general secretary, or even more importantly, chairman of the Central Military Commission for the rest of his life. Um, but we don't know how long, how long that is. And he has certainly set for himself some very unrealistic objectives, uh, not just for Chinese greatness, but for his personal greatness in the Chinese historical narrative. Is he in too much of a rush to be Chen Long uh, 2.0? Great question. Professor, one question. Uh, to stay in, in that topic about the, the war in Ukraine, what about the lessons learned about the economic sanctions? Because that damaged also uh, a lot of companies and also the export of supplies from Russia. But in, in that scenario, in case China took the, take the decision to, uh, to invade Taiwan, the difference between Russia and China is all the economic effort that China have right now. So what about that scenario? That's, that's a great, uh, great, great point. Um, one is that China has far more wealth and economic diversity than Russia. Uh, China, uh, Russia has, is a, is a one-dimensional economy, essentially. Uh, it's resource export driven. Um, but even there, Vladimir Putin was able to shield or soften some of the blows uh, suffered from these economic uh, sanctions. Um, and rather than the whole economy cracking apart, it's been proved to be surprisingly resilient. How long that can go on is not clear. Uh, so I think that's a cautionary lesson because we have many, many fewer economic instruments to punish China with in the event of a crisis. And moreover, economic sanctions take a long time. Uh, so China can soften the blow. It can also it is. It is a major importer of oil, uh, and yes, interdiction of the fuel supply would eventually be catastrophic in China, but that would take months, if not years, to, to fully manifest. Um, but China has no interest in getting involved in a protracted war. Um, and this is not just because they read Sun Tzu, Alate de Riguera, it's because um, you know, protracted war is not something uh, that they can afford. Uh, even though China has this huge economy, is particularly wealthy, the regime knows that failure uh, in military operations uh, speak ill of political legitimacy of re regimes. Moreover, the Chinese military, for all its massive modernizations, has very little experience with long-term, just even peacetime operations far from its own shores. It's got weaknesses in logistics, resupply, um, ordinance capacity, a whole range of things. Um, moreover, the longer, say, a Taiwan scenario plays out, um, the worse things will get for the regime in China. So I think Xi Jinping is, if, if the flag goes up, as it were, if his hand was forced either because of something that happened on Taiwan or a political crisis at home that moved him to action, uh, he would want to get that over very, very quickly make it a, a fait accompli, um, especially before it looks like, based on the Ukraine experience, uh, a coalition of democratic powers, um, sort of massed forces, even if they're only moral forces, uh, against, against Beijing. Thank you.
Tenemos otra pregunta del comandante Godoy. Good afternoon, uh, Lieutenant Commander Juan Godoy. Excuse me, sir, I have a question about uh, great countries. Uh, we know that great countries, that most of them focus in uh, develop their maritime power and in consequence their naval power. In this case, in this case, China is developing, right now is developing his uh, maritime power and naval power. So in consequence, uh, the countries that are around China and, and other great countries feel this like an, a new threat and vice versa. But this is a natural development of a great country. Control their, they are in this case, Chinese Sea. So uh, what, have, what they have to do, accept this like a, a typical development of a new great power, or they have to do something about that? Excellent. Um, several questions uh, in there. Whether or not you view China's return to the sea, um, the development of both commercial and military maritime power as a natural manifestation of China's economic and strategic needs, right? Uh, if you're going to have a great ocean-going navy, uh, you need some degree of, of military capacity. Uh, if you have a, a shoreline as vast as China, uh, if you have as many um, neighbors on your maritime frontiers um, with which you have uh, problematic histories, uh, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, right? Um, if you have competing interests in the Indian Ocean. Um, so are all these just sort of the natural outcomes of you know, China's growth? And how much fear is there uh, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia about China's rise? Um, it depends on who you ask. If you ask our Indian friends, they're much more concerned. They think this is an aggressive move. Uh, if you ask our friends in Bangladesh, um, you know, less so, for a wide re reason of domestic reasons. Uh, for our friends in Pakistan, it depends who you ask. <laughs> if you ask the Navy, you might get one answer. If you get ask the Army, you might get another. Um, you could ask the ISI, but I don't think you'd get an answer. But, um, so the view throughout the region of China's rise is, is complicated, as it were. I think the United States, we're kind of, uh, condition to say any country like the United States, continental power, that chose to build a great navy uh, is, on a, is seeking a trajectory towards hegemony. Um, so that's kind of, that's our own sort of meta narrative of our own maritime history overlaid. Um, the fact that the Chinese read Alfred Theramahan voraciously, cropping up in all their strategic literature. Does that mean that they want to follow the Mahanian script? Uh, or are they sort of picking and choosing from elements of Mahan to suit you know, China's needs? Of course, Mahan advocates that a great trading power must have a great navy, a great navy that is capable of going on the offense, designed to fight and defeat other great navies. So when we see the Chinese reading Mahan and we assume they're going to take a, you know, fully embrace it, then this is very, very alarming. Um, China's naval development um, began specifically as a response to that Taiwan Straits crisis. Um, it didn't begin then. It began before that, but it was primarily driven by this whole range of issues of how long the Chinese coastline is, how more and more Chinese uh, national development was tied up in maritime trade. China needed a better and better navy. Um, Taiwan Straits crisis in 1996 sped that up. Uh, and now they have this increasingly capable Navy with some long-range experience. Um, so the implications of coming up with an answer to that Taiwan dilemma seem to be applicable elsewhere. Xi Jinping talks about China having a great Navy, but he also talks about balance because Unlike the United States at the turn of the, the 20th century, even though a lot of energy was turning inward, the populations and the economy were still on the coasts, right? So the economic centers of gravity of the United States were coastal. 
What's happening in China is that the because of the reform and opening period, at least the economic center of gravity in China shifted to the coast. But the coast is both opportunity and danger, right? Because the Chinese economy became incredibly imbalanced. Uh, the Chinese population became incredibly imbalanced. Um, so part of the process of making China great again is actually to shift the center of gravity more continentally, to actually physically move the populations deeper into China. And this is one of the, the rationales for the Belt and Road, especially the, the belt part of it, these connections through Central Asia across the Eurasian landmass. It's to drive that shift. So does that mean that China is building a navy that's commensurate with its maritime interests, but is balanced against its continental challenges? Uh, that's another thing. And when we get back to this hegemony and humiliation thing, it's always there. So if your memory of China's maritime history is the 19th and 20th centuries, that would seem to be driving China, right? Uh, you couldn't, couldn't afford to have a weak navy. You couldn't afford to rely on the free market. More powerful economic and, and military actors will simply intervene at will in your internal affairs. So to prevent that from happening again, China has to have as good, if not better, a navy than all of its competitors. But if you look back to the period of hegemony, China had a significant navy, actually had several navies in different regions, uh, even in the 17th uh, century. Um, but those navies were balanced in terms of the strategic interests of the empire, which was basically keeping the area within the first island chain safe and secure. Um, and as the Europeans in particular started to show up, the Dutch in Japan, the Spanish in the Philippines, the Portuguese uh, in southwest China, sorry, southeast China, um, that became a natural connection point between the vast Chinese economy and the, the global economy. So having security within the first island chain, this is the, the well, it runs from Japan down Taiwan into Southeast Asia, um, was sufficient. And when China was plugged into the global economy in a healthy way, the Chinese empire thrived. And its hegemony was undergirded, not just because of its domestic greatness, but because of a very healthy relationship with the sea. So, which, which maritime history do you remember? Do you remember the maritime history of humiliation or the maritime history of hegemony? And that's not just an issue for China, it's an issue for those of us who watch China. Where are they leaning in terms of that interpretation? Great question, thank you very much. Yeah, we have one question from Facebook. Uh, thank you, Hannah Wallace Brooks, for your question. I will read. Thank you for that wonderful lecture, Professor. How do you think about the CCP will respond if economic growth continues to slow? Do you worry that diminished legitimacy for the CCP resulting from limited growth or even recession increases the changes of more bellicose action on the international stage? Excellent question, thank you. Uh, I don't usually say thank you to Facebook, but in this case, I'll say thank you to Facebook. Um, uh, Xi Jinping came in uh, to office in 1912, 1912, 2012, um, with, uh, with very strong feelings about the nature of Chinese economic growth and of party economic policy. Uh, he was not a fan of the 1990s or the 2000s for a lot of reasons. Uh, economically, he thought that the party had just both lost control and gone crazy. Uh, lost control of the economy, uh, was focused too much on growth, uh, imbalanced growth, was v far, far too corrupt. Uh, it was just, it was uh, the Wild West, as it were. Uh, 
uh, some China washers call it the naughty oddies, and sense that the zeros were uh, were a bad decade. Yet many of us would say, from looking in from the outside, wow, that that was the acme of the Chinese economic miracle. So Xi Jinping came in wanting to kind of slow that down, the uh, growth at, at, at any expense, uh, not just merely to feed corruption, but that economic growth was the only measure of party legitimacy. Moreover, there's all the various social uh, impacts of this. What, is this do? what does this do to the moral compass of the Chinese people? Um, Xi Jinping's a very moralist kind of guy. What does this do to the, the, the moral compass of the Chinese people? Uh, what does this do to our vulnerability to foreign influence? So Xi Jinping came in wanting to put the brakes on this, on the legacies of, of the 2000s. Um, and you know, also to, to take a swipe as, at his predecessors, especially uh, Hu Jintao, uh, who oversaw some of the, the, what he thought, what Xi Jinping thought were some of the darkest days of uh, that decade. But he hasn't been able to do that. Um, you know, beginning in 2008 with the global economic crisis, uh, the Chinese response to keeping the economy growing was massive infusions of cheap money. Um, you know, using all that foreign trade reserve uh, to support what is, in fact, the biggest part of the Chinese economy, which is construction. Now, it's not exports or imports, it's construction. Um, commercial, residential, uh, government, infrastructure, what have you. Um, this is where we come up with the massive uh, overcapacity of concrete, of steel. China has more idle steel production than the rest of the world has steel production. Um, it doesn't need that, uh, but it has it. Um, so what that showed is that what, what, no matter what Xi Jinping might have wanted to do, this legacy of economic growth and political legitimacy, this, the indivisibility of those two things persisted. Um, for the middle part of, um, so for the early part of Xi Jinping's tenure, uh, he did make some advances towards slowing this down, uh, slowing this soft money things down, uh, and also of uh, uh, you know managing expectations. Whereas it used to be seven percent growth or eight percent growth of GDP every year, year on year, uh, and every year the PRC would meet that mark um, as a, as a key marker of the of the legitimacy of the regime. He says, no, we got to manage expectations. It might not be 8%, it might be 5%, and we might not even meet it. Instead, we have to focus on other things. We want to build a more balanced economy, balanced de demographics, a more balanced society, economic equality, not inequality, massive in inequality. China is still a desperately poor country as well as a lavishly rich country. That's unhealthy. So he's tried to do that. Uh, but COVID intervenes, um, and you know to kind of kickstart the Chinese economy. Yeah, Xi Jinping wanted to loosen or decouple uh, the bonds between the global economy and the Chinese economy to achieve a greater degree of self-sufficiency and um, uh, independence economically and politically. Uh, but COVID was way too fast. <laughs> Uh, that simply ripped apart a lot of those connections. Moreover, the trade war between the Trump administration and China even worsened that. And it doesn't look like the Biden administration is moving back on that at all. Um, so as that decoupling got away from Xi's control, it seems that they are going back to the well one more time. Um, and instead of trying to slow down this uh, this excessive expenditure of government money in the state-owned enterprise sector, especially on construction, um, they've not been able to do that. So that has only magnified the dangers uh, of not merely an economic slowdown on the books, but the perpetuation of the grotesque imbalances uh, in the Chinese economy and the incredibly harmful impact that this is having on Chinese society. Uh, the fever pitch 
of speculation in real estate remains apace. Um, this is driven not merely by the fact that uh, there are very few good investments uh, in China, uh, but it's also driven by the fact of the, the one-child policy. Uh, and I'd be happy to explain that uh, offline sometime. So I think not just sort of the, sort of the immediate crisis response or, or impact economically, um, I think these economic issues, because the party has been unable to solve them, and in some ways has doubled down on them, uh, means that the long-term implications, not, not just merely the, the immediate survival of Xi Jinping or the legitimacy of the party, but the overall economic, social, and cultural health of China um, is at stake. From Newport. Lieutenant Commander Marco Mujica. In relation to the Fleet Tactics book, Hughes mentions that we are in the robotic era. So in his perspective, the United States needs to take advantage of technology, artificial intelligence, wrong, using the concept of lethal distribution against anti-access area denial to break the Chinese chain. What is your opinion about that, to use high technology in, in Asia Pacific? Uh, I am a, I'm a big fan of, of technology. I come from a family of engineers and physicists, uh, but I know nothing about technology itself. I learned a little bit about Inca technology this week. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, for all the effort that uh, the Chinese have put into, and especially Xi Jinping has put into, this, especially like Made in China 2025, this initiative to make China uh, the, the, the world class, um, uh, world class in a whole range of emerging technologies, especially AI. Um, for all that effort, the issues of innovation in China uh, remain problematic. Chinese industry, some parts of Chinese industry are incredibly innovative. There are huge parts of it that just, especially the, the, the hacker field, and this is not computer hacking, this is te technological hacking, incredibly innovative. Um, but a lot of the big ticket innovative uh, is sort of bogged down as, uh, you see this with the aerospace program too. If you look at Xi Jinping's new sort of cabinet, it's sort of stacked with aerospace uh, and cyber folk. Um, is, is too centrally directed. Um, it's too strategic in those senses. And in many ways that can, you can support, you can finance innovation, but if you don't cultivate a culture of innovation, that's highly problematic. Um, in addition, uh, Xi Jinping's latest behavior um, has, so this innovation in China cannot happen without uh, international partnerships simply cannot. Uh, even harnessing these new technologies cannot be done alone in China. Uh, but recent actions that Xi Jinping has taken, especially against the tech sector, um, in the words of one friend of mine in the financial game, has rendered China uninvestable in the tech sector. Uninvestable. Um, and in addition, you see the US uh, and our partners, India, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, many countries, Central and South America, uh, Canada, uh, still innovating at, at a tremendous pace. Um, so, yeah, I would say definitely staying ahead of the high tech sector, uh, but realizing as well that the over strategizing, the over securitizing of high tech, uh, we should definitely be careful about the security threats that high tech present. Um, but I think the opportunities need to be more of the focus. So that would be my, my, my answer to that, even when it comes to military technology. Thank you very much. So we just finished the presentation. Uh, first, thank you very much to the United States Naval War College, especially Admiral Shoshana Chatville, who support us and permit that uh, Dr. Wilson is here right now in Lima, Peru. Doctor, thank you very much for your presence here. 
You are a great supporter of our programs at the Peruvian Labor Law College. We appreciate your support and your presence. And thank you very much for coming. Please, an applause for it. Much gusto. Muchas gracias por la presencia el día de hoy. Hasta luego.